reading titled Finding Joy in Praise was written by Patricia Rabin. When the famous British writer C.S. Lewis first gave his life to Jesus, he initially resisted praising God. In fact, he called praise a stumbling block. His struggle was in the suggestion that God himself demanded it. Yet Lewis finally realized it is in the process of being worshipped that God communicates his presence to his people. Then we, in perfect love with God, find joy in him no more separable than the brightness a mirror receives from the brightness it sheds. The prophet Habakkuk arrived at this conclusion centuries earlier. After complaining to God about evils aimed at the people of Judah, Habakkuk came to see that praising him leads to joy, not in what God does, but in who he is. Thus, even in a national or world crisis, God is still great. As the prophet declared in Habakkuk chapter 3, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior, he added. As C.S. Lewis realized, the whole world rings with praise. Habakkuk, likewise, surrendered to praising God always, finding rich joy in the one who marches on forever. Reading is titled Imperfect Plans, and it was written by Jennifer Benson Schultz. I was exploring the library on the bottom floor of a new community center when an overhead crash suddenly shook the room. A few minutes later, it happened again, and then again. An agitated librarian finally explained that a weightlifting area was positioned directly above the library, and the noise occurred every time someone dropped a weight. Architects and designers had carefully planned many aspects of this state-of-the-art facility, yet someone had forgotten to locate the library away from all the action. In life as well, our plans are often flawed. We overlook important considerations. Our plans don't always account for accidents or surprises. Although planning helps us avoid financial shortfalls, time crunches, and health issues, even the most thorough strategies can't eliminate all problems from our lives. We live in a post-Eden world. With God's help, we can find the balance between prudently considering the future and responding to difficulties. God often has a purpose for the trouble he allows in our lives. He may use it to develop patience in us, to increase our faith, or simply to bring us closer to him. The Bible reminds us in Proverbs 19, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. As we submit our goals and hopes for the future to Jesus, He'll show us what He wants to accomplish in us and through us. The Frosting of Faith Hand in hand, my grandson and I skipped across the parking lot to find a special back-to-school outfit A preschooler now, he was excited about everything, and I was determined to ignite his happiness into joy. I'd just seen a coffee mug with the inscription, Grandmas are moms with lots of frosting. Frosting equals fun, glitter, joy. That's my job description as his grandma, right? That and more. In his second letter to his spiritual son, Timothy, Paul calls out his sincere faith and then credits its lineage, both to Timothy's grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. These women lived out their faith in such a way that Timothy also came to believe in Jesus. Surely, Lois and Eunice loved Timothy and provided for his needs. 
but clearly they did more. Paul points to the faith living in them as the source of the faith later living in Timothy. My job as a grandmother includes the frosting moment of a back-to-school outfit, but even more, I'm called to the frosting moments when I share my faith, bowing our heads over chicken nuggets, noticing angelic cloud formations in the sky as God's works of art, chirping along with a song about Jesus on the radio. Let's be wooed by the example of moms and grandmas like Eunice and Lois to let our faith become the frosting in life so that others will want what we have. Titled, Serving the Least, and it was authored by John Blaze. His name is Spencer, but everybody calls him Spence. He was a state track champion in high school, and then he went on to attend a prestigious university on a full academic scholarship. He lives now in one of America's largest cities and is highly respected in the field of chemical engineering. But if you were to ask Spence his greatest achievements to date, he wouldn't mention any of those things. He would excitedly tell you about the trips he makes to Nicaragua every few months to check in on the kids and teachers in the tutoring program he helped establish in one of the poorest areas of the country. And he'd tell you how enriched his life has been by serving them. The least of these. It's a phrase people use in a variety of ways, yet Jesus used it to describe those who, according to the world standards, have little or nothing to offer us in return for our service. They are the men and women and children the world often overlooks, if not forgets completely. Yet, it's exactly those people Jesus elevates to such a beautiful status by saying in Matthew 25, Whatever you did for them, you did for me. You don't have to have a degree from a prestigious university to understand Christ's meaning. Serving the least is the same as serving Him. All it really takes is a willing heart. Reading titled, Live Like It's Morning, was written by Glenn Pacquiam. When I have to travel across time zones by air, I try various remedies to avoid jet lag. I think I've tried them all. On one occasion, I decided to adjust my in-flight eating to the time zone where I was heading. Instead of eating dinner with the rest of the passengers, I kept watching a movie and tried to fall asleep. The hours of elective fasting were difficult, and the breakfast that came right before we landed left much to be desired. But living out of sorts with those around me worked. It jolted my body clock into a new time zone. Paul knew that if believers in Jesus were to truly reflect him in their lives, they would need to live out of step with the world around them. They were once darkness, but now they were to live as children of light, as it says in Ephesians 5.8. And what might that look like? Paul goes on to fill out the picture in Ephesians 5.9, the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Sleeping through dinner may have seemed foolish to the people on my flight, but even as it's midnight in the world, as believers, we're called to live like it's morning. This may provoke scorn and opposition, but in Jesus, we can walk in the way of love, following the example of the one who loves us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I'm Kirsten Holmberg, that I titled The Baggage Activity. Karen, a middle school teacher, created an activity to teach her students how to better understand one another. In The Baggage Activity, students wrote down some of the emotional weights they were carrying. The notes were shared anonymously, giving the students insight into each other's hardships, often with a tearful response from their peers. 
The classroom has since been filled with a deeper sense of mutual respect among the young teens, who now have a greater sense of empathy for one another. Throughout the Bible, God has nudged His people to treat one another with dignity and show empathy in their interaction with others. As early in the history of Israel as the book of Leviticus, God pointed the Israelites toward empathy, especially in their dealings with foreigners. He said to love them as themselves because they too had been foreigners in Egypt and knew that hardship intimately. Sometimes the burdens we carry make us feel like foreigners, alone and misunderstood, even among our peers. We don't always have a similar experience to draw on as the Israelites did with the foreigners among them. Yet we can always treat those God puts in our paths with the respect and understanding that we ourselves desire. Whether a modern-day middle schooler, an Israelite, or anything in between, we honor God when we do. Extending Mercy was written by Amy Boucher Pye. Reflecting on how she forgave Manasseh, the man who killed her husband and some of her children in the Rwandan genocide, Beata said, My forgiving is based on what Jesus did. He took the punishment for every evil act throughout all time. His cross is the place we find victory, the only place. Manasseh had written to Beata from prison more than once, begging her and God for forgiveness as he detailed the regular nightmares that plagued him. At first, she could extend no mercy, saying she hated him for killing her family. But then, Jesus intruded into her thoughts. And with God's help some two years later, she forgave him. In this, Beata followed Jesus' instruction to his disciples to forgive those who repent. He said in Luke chapter 17 that even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. But to forgive can be extremely difficult, as we see by the disciples' reaction. Increase our faith. Beata's faith increased as she wrestled in prayer over her inability to forgive. If, like her, we're struggling to forgive, we can ask God through His Holy Spirit to help us to do so. As our faith increases, He helps us to forgive. Entitled, Windows. Near the foothills of the Himalayas, a visitor noticed a row of houses without windows. His guide explained that some of the villagers feared that demons might sneak into their homes while they slept, so they built impermeable walls. You could tell when a homeowner began to follow Jesus because he put in windows to let in the light. A similar dynamic may take place in us, though we might not see it quite that way. We live in scary, polarizing times. Satan and his demons instigate angry divisions that split families and friends. <laughs> I often feel like hiding behind my walls. But Jesus wants me to cut in a window. In the book of Isaiah, Israel sought refuge in higher walls. But God said their security lay with him. He reigns from heaven, and his word governs all. If Israel would return to him... God would have mercy on them and restore them as His people to bless the world. He would lift them up, ultimately leading them in a triumphal parade. As Isaiah 55.13 says, Their celebration will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Sometimes, walls are necessary. Walls with windows are best. They show the world that we trust God for the future. Our fears are real. Our God is greater. Windows open us to Jesus, the light of the world, and to others who need Him. James Banks, and the reading is titled, Hard Ground and Tender Mercy. 
When James was just six years old, his older brother David died tragically in an ice skating accident. It was the day before David's 14th birthday. In the years that followed, James tried his best to console his mother Margaret, who in her deep grief sometimes reminded herself that her elder son would never have to face the challenges of growing up. In James Berry's fertile imagination, decades later, that same idea would burgeon into inspiration for a much-loved children's story character who never aged, Peter Pan. Like a flower pushing its way through pavement, good emerged even from the hard ground of unthinkable heartache. How comforting is the thought that God, in an infinitely more creative way, is able to bring good out of our most difficult circumstances. A beautiful illustration of this occurs in the Old Testament story of Ruth. Naomi lost her two sons, leaving her without means or support. Her widowed daughter-in-law, Ruth, chose to remain with Naomi to help provide for her and to serve her God. In the end, God's provision brought them unexpected joy. Ruth remarried and had a child, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. He would also be listed among the ancestors of Jesus. God's tender mercy reaches beyond our ability to fathom and meets us in surprising places. Keep looking. Perhaps you'll see it today. reading titled Quarantined by Fear was written by Julie Schwab. In 2020, an outbreak of the coronavirus left the world in fear. People were quarantined, countries were put under lockdown, flights and large events were canceled. Those living in areas with no known cases still feared that they might get the virus. Graham Davy an expert in anxiety, believes that negative news broadcasts are likely to make you sadder and more anxious. A meme that circulated on social media showed a man watching the news on TV, and he asked how to stop worrying. In response, another person in the room reached over and flipped off the TV, suggesting that the answer might be a shift in focus. Luke 12 gives us some advice to help us stop worrying seek his kingdom. We seek God's kingdom when we focus on the promise that his followers have an inheritance in heaven. When we face difficulty, we can shift our focus and remember that God sees us and knows our needs. Jesus encourages his disciples in verse 32, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. God enjoys blessing us. Let's worship Him, knowing He cares for us more than the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. Even in difficult times, we can read the scriptures, pray for God's peace, and trust in our good and faithful God. <laughs> 